I'm Chris Farrell, and this is On Watch. Welcome, everybody, to On Watch, the Judicial Watch podcast, where we take a deep dive on topics that are underreported by the news media or uh, issues that deal with corruption. And of course, we enjoy recovering lost history. And we also like uh, trying to explain the inexplicable. And to help us do that today, we are very fortunate to have the one and only Julie Kelly joining us. Uh, she reports on all sorts of topics that uh, the mainstream media would rather you forget, as well as, some, as well as some very cowardly politicians would rather you uh, not remember the things that she pursues. We're very happy that she's with us. But first, uh, I want to be sure that you like and subscribe to this podcast, whether you're watching us on YouTube or on Spotify or whatever platform you use. Please subscribe to us, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so, Julie Kelly, our guest today, is a political commentator and independent journalist writing on Substack. Uh, I am very certain that many of you Judicial Watch supporters are familiar with her work. Uh, it's been amazing, tremendous stuff. She's written two books as well. The first is Disloyal Opposition, How the Never Trump Right Tried and Failed to Take Down the President. And secondly, a topic that we're going to touch on, I think, in greater length today, uh, January 6th. How Democrats used the Capitol protest to launch a war on terror against the political right. So, having said all that, welcome Julie Kelly to On Watch. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for having me on. And I want to thank Judicial Watch, you, and of course, Tom Fitton for all your support uh, and covering my work on uh, all of these topics. So, thank you so much for having me on. We well, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. A lot of our stuff sort of intersects. Mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that you've covered and talked about, we haven't, and stuff that we pursued, you know, we kind of feed, if you, if you read everything that you've written and looked at our work, you get a pretty comprehensive view, I think, of January 6th and a lot of the weirdness and the political corruption around that. Speaking mm -hmm. of which, uh, I think it's very important to talk to you on the subject today because it's my opinion, my evaluation, that in some way, January 6th and all the, the sub-stories around that it's really sort of sliding out of the public's consciousness. It's not first and foremost. It seems to be sort of a oh yeah or a footnote. Tell me your thoughts on that and really what, how the American public should be thinking about it and pursuing the story. You know, Chris, I guess it's hard for me as someone who's so close to this issue on a day to day basis to get a fair grasp of the American people's interest level uh, or passionate uh, passion level about it. But to me, and, and I think that that's probably true that there it has been sort of a dip in interest. I think um, the January 6th committee finishing up their work, releasing their report, then sort of ghosting most of their material and the conclusion of the high profile trials, including the Oath Keepers and then the Proud Boys trial, right. which I think is the most consequential trial related to Donald Trump. And we could talk about that a little bit. Sure. So I think after all that coverage and hype, a lot of it has sort of diminished. But I will say, if so, it is the calm before the storm. Because special counsel Jack Smith continues to investigate uh, Donald Trump, his associates, um, his attorneys, for the events of January 6th. We just got news uh, this past few days that Jack Smith's grand jury has issued subpoenas to numerous Arizona elected officials and offices trying to get an understanding of what Donald Trump uh, was trying to do there to expose voter fraud. This is not over by a long shot. And if there is a lull, I encourage people to catch up on what's been happening with January 6th and the criminal investigations, both into Trump supporters and Donald Trump because Jack Smith will be bringing a multi-count felony criminal indictment against the president and possibly some of his attorneys and associates for what happened on January 6th, and that probably will be next month or September. You know, there's sort of time phasing. This is a, this is a controlled demolition effort, really, on the part of Jack Smith. I can tell you that my colleague and friend of the last, I want to say 24 years we've worked together, uh, Tom Fitton was actually subpoenaed in uh, appeared before the Smith grand jury. 
and they asked penetrating questions on things like tweets and opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really, there was an element, of, it was a cartoonishly bizarre experience mm -hmm. for Tom in many ways because uh, they spent an awful lot of time. They were very concerned that Tom didn't remember what he had for lunch at the White House one day. So there's, there's that level of sort of weird, uh, obsessive, fixated behavior by their attorneys. But the notion that uh, they're pursuing people based upon what was tweeted or not, uh, you know, as you well know, there's nothing illegal or unlawful about people talking about and thinking about alter alternate slates of electors. Uh, it's been done right. before. People have engaged in debates about it. People have offered alternative slates of electors. But somehow they're trying to take that and criminalize that. Can you explain that a little more about what the whole idea of people having different slates of electors and the idea of offering one over another? Right. So the, uh, to your point, this is something that has been done before. If you will recall, in after the 2016 election, there was a coordinated effort, not just for alternative electors, but to flip um, electors who were had committed to Donald Trump and trying to flip them in swing states to get them to flip their support from Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton. A lot of this was just a political stunt um, at, in 2020. To your point, nothing unlawful about it. There was nothing that was going to be taken seriously. I believe in some states you can have an alternative slate of, of electors. Um, right. But what this really is, is to punish people who were trying to expose voter and election fraud in these key states. And that's what Jack Smith and this Department of Justice is doing. They are using um, his office. They are using the law and the courts and the grand jury to punish people like Tom Fitton. How dare you question the outcome of the 2020 election? Now we're gonna force you to hire an attorney and we're gonna waste your time and we're gonna hold potential charges over your head. And that's what they're doing to hundreds of people. Well, and now, you know, you have over a thousand Trump supporters, Chris, who have already been criminally charged for the events of January 6th. And they're, they're going to use that to build this criminal case against Donald Trump. Um, but associates who had nothing to do with January 6th, it wasn't about the four hour disturbance and who broke a window and who assaulted a police officer and, you know, who was screaming for Nancy Pelosi. This is to, um, and what is it? it's successfully done really is to um to quash all questions about what happened in the 2020 election to criminalize political dissent and use this as a warning shot don't even try to do this in the 2024 election because we've already set all this crazy case law precedent for if you try to overturn an election or you question um certain voting uh methods or the outcome you are going to be labeled an insurrectionist and the Justice Department, to the extent that it can, or even other local attorneys, uh, will use that as evidence against you to, to prosecute you. It's really my dangerous my recollection, unprecedented my, territory. You are correct. My recollection is that the January 6th committee chairman, Mr. Thompson, in 2016, he offered an alternative slate of electors from his home state, I believe, of Ohio. Uh, so it's very, there, there's a great irony here. It's, the irony is quite rich that uh, if you're on the right side of things and if you're a political ally of the people currently in office, you could do anything you damn well please. Uh, if you're on the other side of the equation, you're a criminal. And it's, it's that blatantly, flagrantly obvious uh, that this, this disparity in justice, it's mm -hmm. breathtaking. Um, I wanted to slide over a little bit more kind of following this line of thought on, on, on how Jack Smith is pursuing things. His sidekick in all this is a guy named Graves, who's the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. Can you tell us a little bit about M Matthew Graves? Sure, so Matthew Graves uh, was an advisor to Joe Biden's 2020 presidential campaign. In October of 2021, Joe Biden nominated Matthew Graves to be the D.C. U.S. Attorney. The Senate uh, not uh, approved, confirmed Matthew Graves in November of 2021. After he was confirmed, Matthew Graves accelerated the criminal investigation and prosecution into Trump supporters. He is the one who, for the first time, 
brought seditious conspiracy charges against more than two dozen January 6th protesters, members of the Oath Keepers and members of the Proud Boys. This, Chris, was purposeful. It was not because any of them committed something like seditious conspiracy, which um, it is tantamount to treason, which is what the blind shake and his associates were charged and convicted of for bombing the World Trade Center in 1993, killing six people and injuring hundreds, right. not for entering the Capitol building without any weapons dressed in military garb. Uh, this is basically so Matthew Grace was doing this to help bolster the narrative that January 6th was this insurrection, was a domestic terror attack. Um, and so that's the sort of politicized, uh, weaponized charges that he brought. He also has sought excessive prison sentences for those who have um, either pleaded guilty or been convicted at trial. Of course, convictions by a Washington, D.C. jury are not really a tough task for Matthew Graves and his line prosecutors, a city that's almost 100 percent Democrats. Um, and so he is a highly right. partisan figure. But on my Substack this week, I write about his wife, Fatima Goss Graves who is head of a nearly $100 million radical nonprofit called the National Women's Law Center. And uh, this is a abortion on demand, pro-transgender rights, uh, universal income, universal health care organization. She also is taking the lead in trying to oust Clarence Thomas from the Supreme Court. Uh, what I write about this week, oh, go so ahead. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, let me tap the, let me tap the brakes for a second on that because I think this requires special attention. So Matthew Graves, the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, his wife, her name yes, is Fatima. Fatima Gra Graves. She heads up, what, what was it, the National Law Women's Center. Legal Center? Correct. Okay. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm doing this slowly and carefully because I want our viewing and listening audience to pay attention to this. This is classic yep. D.C., this is, you know, the one person works somewhere, the other person works in a related field. In this case, it's always somebody exercising the law in an excessively mm -hmm. abusive way. And then the spouse has some cultural Marxist operation okay. that they, you know, advocate for uber lefty causes. And, and that's what you're describing here. So I, I, I pause there because I want this to sink in. So this, please describe again, the U.S. Attorney Graves here in D.C. Explain again what who his wife is and what she right, runs. Right, and thank you for slowing me down. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. So her name is. No, because you just know it so well. That's why. I mean, it's it's very. It becomes matter of fact. But our listeners right now are you know they're falling over in their chairs. When and they, they really this. should, Chris. I mean, uh, and the fact that the media, especially January six reporters, have completely ignored. Fatima Goss Graves' role, heading up this $100 million nonprofit, having Kamala Harris's niece, Mina, sit on the board of directors. Matthew Graves also was at the same um, law firm as the second gentleman, Doug, uh, Doug Emhoff, uh, before he was appointed DC U.S. attorney. And now Fatima Goss Graves not only leads this very powerful, very well-funded you're talking about the most flush foundations in the country and the world, really, who donate to her nonprofit. So not only is she helping to lead this coordinated effort to oust Clarence Thomas from the Supreme Court, as I write about this week, she has visited the Biden White House at least 28 times in the past two years. She only visited three times before her husband, Matthew, was confirmed by the Senate in November of 2021. Since that time, Chris, Fatima Goss Graves has been at the White House an average of once a month. She has attended high. I was going to say, it's, it's, it sounds like a, like a monthly update or monthly briefing on the, the latest uh accomplishments in their program. Well, I refer to it as an all access pass. Not only does she attend big events where Joe Biden is present and Jill Biden and Kamala Harris, but also top officials. Um, this looks like sort of a reward, a quid pro quo for Matthew Graves, who continues every week, Chris, to arrest and charge January 6th uh, protesters for protesting Joe Biden's election now two and a half years ago this week. 
still rounding them up and prosecuting them. And at the same time, giving his wife, uh, you know, the golden keys to the White House, attending star study galas like the Elton John concert and the James Taylor concert. It also looks like both of them, Matthew and Fatima Graves, were at the White House during the 4th of July barbecue last year. Um, so this appears to be a highly unusual arrangement where the lead prosecutor handling and punishing Trump supporters for opposing Joe Biden's election on January 6th uh, looks like a reward for him and his wife to have this sort of access and certainly talk to her donors and her supporters about that unprecedented level of access. That's very cozy. That, that's really very uh, convenient and uh, and I'm sure it's all completely coincidental. There's no connection, no tie. Uh, it's just, you know, spontaneously occurs all by itself. Um, speaking of things that are not necessarily uh, occurring spontaneously and, and at random, um, you wrote not too, not too long ago, a couple of weeks back, about William Bosanko, who is the executive director, or I may have his title wrong. He might be operating officer, mm -hmm. whatever. He's the, the, not the archivist, but like the number two, number three guy at the National Archives. And Mr. Bosanko was in front of Congress talking about why NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, why NARA was so interested in President Trump's records. Can you fill in some blanks on that story? Yes, for us? this was very interesting. So he testified before the House Intelligence Committee and they wanted to press him about the origins of the investigation and why they um, you know, were harassing Donald Trump to get records back that had been taken from the White House and taken to Mar-a-Lago. So what Mr. Bosenko, I do believe he's CEO, you're right, not archivist, but one of the top bureaucrats over at the National Archivist. So what he claimed was that when they were starting to go through records that had been given to the archives from the Trump White House, that they had a long list. This is what Bosenko told the House Intelligence Committee. They had a long list of things that were missing. Well, when someone like uh, it was Representative Elise Stefanik sort of confronted Mr. Bosanko and said, well, what documents were you looking for? And he said, well, we were looking for the letter that Barack Obama left for Donald Trump in the White House before he departed and correspondence between Donald Trump and uh, North Korean President Kim Jong-il. That was it. And so when they tried to get him to say, well, what other records were you looking for that shouldn't have been there? All of a sudden his mind went blank. He couldn't, he couldn't re recall. <laughs> but this was the setup, right? This is the pattern that you guys yeah. have covered over and over that we've seen over and over. These self-serving bureaucrats, certainly at the behest of some powerful politician behind the scenes, it could be Adam Schiff, could be Barack Obama, who knows? sets up this ruse, this trap for Donald Trumpers people saying, oh, well, we we have all these records missing. So what does Donald Trump and his team do instead of telling William Bosanko and the archives to go pound sand or if you want my records, you know, <laughs> hire some lawyers? What do they do? They right. hand over 15 boxes to this clown and the archives in January of 2022. And then, you know, it's off yep. to the races. That was yeah, there's an expression that the, the, the president is not well served. But uh, for our viewers and listeners to this podcast, let me fill in a blank here for you. You've probably heard Tom or myself discuss the Clinton sock drawer case, and you're going to hear it again. But here's how it ties in to Mr. Bosanko's disingenuous testimony. The Clinton sock drawer case is a case that I have sad to say, but we lost about 12 years ago. Uh, Bill Clinton met with a guy named Taylor Branch on 89 occasions and did an oral history of his presidency. A lot of the stuff he talked about was classified. But they took tapes, Bill Clinton got a set of tapes, and he literally put them in his sock drawer. That's where he kept them. He just tucked them in the back of the drawer and ignored it. We heard about this oral history, the work by Taylor Branch, the book that was supposed to come out. And we said, well, you know, those tapes are part of the president's records. We want to see them. And we sued. We went and sued the National Archives to get them. We lost the case because Judge Amy Berman Jackson, who's still sitting here in the U.S. District Court for mm -hmm. D.C., Judge Amy Berman Jackson said a couple of things. Number one, the president has absolute 
unreviewable authority to take anything he wants as his personal records. He decides what's a presidential record, what's a personal record. He can take it and that's it. It, it has the same authority as like when the president pardons someone. No one can come in and say, oh no, you can't do that, or we want to vote on it, or it's absolute authority, unreviewable. That's what J, uh, Judge Amy Berman Jackson said. And then part two, that doesn't get enough coverage, part two of that decision, she went on to say, and the National Archives and Congress, both, have no authority whatsoever to second guess or what if the president on what he takes, none. In fact, she specifically prohibits NARA and Congress from asking questions of or seeking to get records from the president. So this thing is signed, sealed, and delivered. It has been the law of the land for the last 12 years until it's President Trump. So President Clinton gets to do whatever he damn well pleases. President Trump, suddenly all these experts come out of the woodwork and they try to tell you how what he did is wrong and bad and they need the records. It is a load of garbage. I'm being very kind. I'm, I'm censoring my language. It is a load of garbage. It's much like the phony whistleblower, non-whistleblower, Eric Chiamarelli, who came out of the woodwork to try to destroy Trump on the Ukraine phone call. You talk about another great irony of ironies. While Biden and company are hauling in cash from Ukraine, Trump's phone call was perfect, and I happen to agree with him, it was. Um, Julie, one, uh, one last topic to touch on uh, with you, and I, uh, this one, I know that you were looking at the crazy Michigan militia, phony kidnap story with the governor out there, where you had, you know, 12 FBI informants recruiting 14 people. Like half the operation was FBI people. Um, the guy who was the, the special agent in charge out in Detroit was a guy named Dan Tuono. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but I think that's mm -hmm. what it was. And surprise, surprise, that case, which kind of fell apart, even though they did nail a couple of guys on state charges, that was actually a rehash of a Barack Obama, Eric Holder 2009 case called the Hutteries. It, it, it is literally a, a carbon copy. Uh, so this group back in 2009, the FBI went out and recruited some low IQ people and you know, armed them, equipped them, trained them, gave them direction, and then went out and arrested them. The FBI is very good at this. So that happened in 2009. 2009. Now we have the Michigan militia case. You reported on that. It's virtually the same thing. They find these low IQ kind of loser guys. They find them, they recruit them, they train them, they arm them, they equip them, and then they go out and they arrest them. Surprise, surprise. And they have almost half the people involved are FBI guys. So that, that whole thing was done under the direction of a special agent in charge named Dan Tuono, who then magically ends up being the head of the Washington mm -hmm. field office. Yes. And then, in the, in the third iteration of his life, once he retires, he suddenly shows up as being an expert witness, saying how he didn't agree with how the raid on Mar-a-Lago was done. Yeah. And he's very critical about how DOJ was handling it. Th to me, this is a very interesting character. And so I just wanted to get some of your ideas, your feelings about who this character is, what he was doing, and it seems like he's trying to reinvent himself in retirement. What, what are your thoughts? So fascinating, Chris, because I have covered Stephen D'Antuano now for almost two years. He was head of the Detroit FBI field office. This was the office that was responsible not just for the lead informant, Dan Chappell, but also the supervising agents who were handling the informant and at least three undercover agents. They were all run out of the Detroit uh, FBI field office and their satellites. So Stephen D'Antuano, uh, you know, we sort of call him the bag man for the Democratic Party. So what he did and his agents and there were other field offices across the country who were involved in this as they stitched together this so-called militia group and trapped them, um, made it look like they were trying to plot to kidnap and possibly assassinate 
Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Now, Chris, as you may recall, the arrests in that case was announced a month before Election Day in 2020. This was yet another way of the FBI to interfere in the election. It also happened around the same time the Hunter Biden laptop coverage was going to be published in the New York Post. So they... Right. And for for clarity, the, the dog whistle was these kidnap plotters had to be Trumpers, exactly right? right? These are Trump, Trumpistas. And so that's the dog whistle. These are white supremacists, blah, right. blah, blah. That was a whole narrative. And I think, in fact, Gretchen Whitmer even like attacked Trump in, in the announcement of the arrest of these guys, I believe. She did. She gave this. Uh, now, keep in mind, Gretchen Whitmer knew about this for months. The FBI had install, installed poll cameras at her cottage, which was supposed to be the scene of the crime. She knew all along what was happening. No one has actually questioned her about what she knew, who she was speaking with. Was she speaking with Stephen D'Antuano? That's what I would like to know. Who had her uh, sure. involved in this? So she knew the whole time that she was under no threat by the guy who lived, the homeless guy who lived in the basement of a vacuum repair shop in a Grand Rapids strip mall, uh, you know, who was so poor he right. couldn't eat, barely afford to eat. And that's how this main FBI informant ingratiated himself with this man, Adam Fox. Anyway, another example, not only did Gretchen Whitmer, you know, trot out the, the sob story after the arrests were announced in October 8th of 2020, so did Joe Biden. He and Kamala Harris made this a big issue on the campaign trail in the closing weeks of the 2020 campaign, talking about how these domestic terrorist right wing militiamen tied to Donald Trump wanted to kidnap and kill Gretchen Whitmer. So it was all orchestrated. Well, Stephen D'Antuano gets rewarded by FBI Director Christopher Wray with the plum assignment of head of the FBI uh, Washington field office. He was the guy in charge of the FBI, at least on the ground for January 6th. He led the criminal investigation into January 6th. He allegedly led the pipe bomb investigation. Of course, we still don't have the pipe bomber. I was going to say, what what, what investigation? <laughs> that, that, that died on the vine. Right. So the House has just interviewed Stephen D'Antuano, and they're releasing little snippets of his testimony. Very interesting. Uh, he seemed to have no interest in the pipe bomb. And get this, Chris, he told Congress that, oh, gee, some of the cell phone data that we got for January 5th, that was the night that the pipe bomber allegedly set the explosives outside of the RNC and DNC that, oh, some of that data was corrupted. And gee, maybe it was from the same provider that the alleged pipe bomber had. So that investigation is at a dead end to the extent that it ever was anything more than a hoax. Um, but Dan Tuano, to your point, did raise some serious objections to how Maine Justice was conducting not just the raid of Mar-a-Lago, but the entire investigation. Because, Chris, DOJ and then Jack Smith conducted 99% of the Mar-a-Lago investigation in Washington, D.C., So it could get the rubber stamp of Beryl Howell, the chief judge, and allow the grand jury in Washington, D.C. to sign off on all these subpoenas. Then at the last minute, changed the venue to Southern Florida, which was the appropriate venue for the investigation and for the charges. So Dan Tuano, oddly, um, we're told, uh, objected to how Maine Justice was handling this. Now, my suspicion, Chris, is because at the same time this was happening in August of 2022, um, you had just had the second trial, the first trial for the four men charged with federal kidnapping conspiracy charges. Two were outright acquitted amid the FBI entrapment right. defense. Two got a hung jury. So Stephen D'Antuano was already under fire in uh, close speculation uh, for what he had done in that case. So maybe that was the way to try to save face. I don't know. Um, but they're still uh, yeah. they're still waiting it, for that transcript. The pattern, yeah, the pattern for me is very disturbing because, like I said, you have this 2009 Huttery, H U T A R E E. It's mm-hmm. a weird name. The Huttery case. In Michigan. Like the same, yeah, the same format. It, you know, guys in a trailer drinking moonshine, hanging out unemployed and these FBI guys tried to recruit them for some crazed militia group, whatever. And they do everything the FBI tells them to do and then they arrest them. And then it ends up that the case collapses and then the the people 
who are involved get attorneys that then sue Department of Justice. It, it's the same mess. Mm -hmm. And so they try to reinvent it, uh, in this case with Gretchen Whitmer. The facts are very sketchy and bad. You read some of the transcripts about how the only reason some of these guys showed up is because the FBI guys uh, brought in a lot of weed and beer, mm -hmm. and so they'd all get messed up, they'd get yep. wasted together, and they, that, that was the incentive for committing some crime. I mean, it, when you read it, it's wacky. It makes no sense, and it's clearly one of these setup jobs. But then, surprise, surprise, this is the same guy who now shows up in D.C., I think in November, mm -hmm. two months before January 6th. Yep. And there's people that ask questions about, well, how many confidential human sources were in the crowd on January 6th? How many people were being recruited? Who knew what in advance? Who was communicating? And it, you ask this question, then they want to brand you, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, or you're an insurrection supporter, or all kinds of other reckless language, just for asking legit questions about some pretty weird behavior and stuff that's even on video now. Well, Chris, speculation that uh, the number of confidential human sources, i.e. FBI informants involved in January 6th is not speculation. It has been proven in trial and produced reluctantly so by the government. We know that there were um, at least five or six uh, informants run into the Oath Keepers, including the number two Oath Keeper. The government finally stipulated that eight confidential human sources were embedded in the Proud Boys before January 6th. Tri but during trial, uh, investigators had to admit that there could have been close to 20 and they weren't just in these groups. They were in group chats. They were stoking a lot of the discussion that was then used as evidence in trial against these Proud Boys. You have reporting. We know that at least two FBI informants were with the Proud Boys during the breach. And they were reporting back to their handler that there was no plan to attack the Capitol. And so it's not just speculation and it's not just Christopher Ray evading direct questions about the role and conduct of these CHSs before and on January 6th. We know now because of these trials that there were multiple informants and what still uh, need to know and Republicans need to keep pushing despite maybe some lag in interest, what these federal assets and not just from the FBI, DHS, the Secret Service, DC Metro Police, all of these agencies, the Defense Department, unfortunately, all of these assets, what were they doing before January 6th and what were they doing that day to provoke and incite exactly a lot of the confrontations and violence that we saw that afternoon? I mean, it just leaves you to wonder if you extract all those characters, all that effort, all that time, money, energy, et cetera, if you extract that from January 6th, does it just end up being a loud rally yep. outside the Capitol? I mean, it, that is a legitimate question to ask. It's a great point. That's right. Take all of those interests, all of those assets, all the time beforehand. Take all of that away, remove it, put the needed security that um, people like Stephen Sun, the Capitol Police Chief, was begging for days before, put the needed security where it was instead of a vacant Washington, D.C., where there was no police presence, at least visible. <laughs> Certainly a lot of uh, plain clothed right. and undercover officers that we know of. Um, but, but do what needed to be done and take away that element of the government, local and federal, uh, in, in what happened and none of this would have taken place on January 6th, which of course begs the question, then why did it? And look at what the Democrats have exploited out of this leveraged that afternoon for very successfully um, and, and still more to come. And I can tell you that on inauguration day, when Biden was up on the Capitol taking the oath, there were 27,000 uh, military members people from the armed forces in the city with triple, band, triple strand concertina fences. I mean, uh, I'm old enough to remember what East Berlin was like. In fact, right. I was in East Berlin several times. Uh, the, the Washington, D.C. had the feeling of East Berlin on Inauguration Day. And so when they, when they want to turn out an image or project power, they know how to do it. Uh, and then when they want to infiltrate, they know how to do that, too. It's, uh, 
it is a very disturbing sequence of events, that's for sure. It is. And what's really sad for me as someone who's covered this now for two and a half years is seeing how it has successfully destroyed the lives of so many people, destroyed so many families, bankrupted good, decent people. And to watch, and I use this word, Chris, the sadistic behavior of these lying prosecutors and these judges who are gratified by the pain that they're inflicting on people simply because they supported Donald Trump. What I've witnessed right. in those courtrooms and on these court filings is nothing that any American should cheer. Um, but of course, you do have at least half the country, uh, maybe not half, maybe a third, uh, who want the ultimate pu punishment levied against these Trump supporters and would be happy if every single one of them were thrown in that special jail in Washington, D.C., reserved just for January 6th protesters. Julie, I want to thank you for taking as much time as you have and answering all the questions. All the, we covered a lot of ground today, but I think it's important stuff and it's stuff that is too easily forgotten or pushed off to, you know, oh, yeah, sort of a footnote. Uh, it can't be a footnote. There's a lot of stuff going on that the American public needs to never forget and never forget for the right reasons, not for the reasons that uh, uh, Joe Biden wants you to forget about it. Um, I want to give you the last word. Tell us where folks can find you uh, and your excellent work and uh, any other closing thoughts that you may have. All yours. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for having me on. Thank you for all the work that Judicial Watch does. Um, you know, who knows where we would be in terms of uncovering so much of this without your organization and your supporters and your donors. So thank you. Uh, my work can be found at Substack. It's Declassified with Julie Kelly. I'm on Twitter quite a bit, Julie underscore Kelly, too, where I post breaking motions, uh, court filings, et cetera. So I do a lot of work uh, work there. So, and, and like I said, plenty more to come. This Jack Smith and Department of Justice are just getting warmed up. Julie, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and all your excellent work. And uh, we encourage all of our uh, viewers and listeners to get on your Twitter feed and see all the latest mischief you're up to. There's some really good snarky tweets on there too. I always enjoy good, a good dig in there every now and then. Um, but uh, your, work, your work has been tremendous and we appreciate it very much. Thank you again. Thanks, Chris. I'm Chris Farrell on Watch.